And good evening. Welcome to uh, where am I at? Welcome to <laughs> Eagle Mountain International Church, the revival capital of the world. It is a great day to be here and to be with you and to be with you from the top of the world to the bottom, all the way around the middle. We're so excited about tonight. It has been a wonderful week here. I mean, from Sunday with Rick Renner, Pastor Terry, and Faith Foundations, and, and all of it has just been wonderful. I didn't introduce myself. My name is Greg Stevens. I'm an associate pastor here, and I'm so grateful to be able to welcome you into our Bible study this evening. Get your Bible, get your notepad, get everything ready for a wonderful time in the Word. John Jester is going to open the Word for us in a minute, and we always pray, wash us in your Word, right? Reveal yourself to us. And uh, I know that that's going to be the case again tonight. So many things are happening here on the mountain. So many things I want to make you aware of. Uh, we have a very special day coming up this Sunday with Pastor George at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 10 um, Central Time, the church service. There is a great expectation. Right before we came live with you on the network, they were talking to me we were talking about it. That's why I was a little frazzled coming to you. There is such an expectation on the power of God. I spoke to a man yesterday in town, and um, we were talking about, so I was talking to him about a pickup truck. And we were talking, and he said, oh, Pastor George, that, that church over there. And I said, yeah. He said, I had a car, he had a motorcycle accident years ago. And he said, I was at Walmart, and I saw Pastor George and Terry at Walmart, and they prayed for me in the cosmetics aisle <laughs> about my motorcycle wreck in my arm. And he said, my arm tingled with electricity for over a week. And he told me what church he goes to in town. I said, listen, I don't want to take you away from your church, but this Sunday the Lord spoke to Pastor George to have a healing and miracle service. He says, I'm coming. I'm coming. Listen, there's talk happening about what's going to happen this Sunday. So get your faith ready. Get your faith ready uh, for those things as well. Let me just play you our church announcements and a few other spots and uh, talk about that. We'll be back. Watch this. We'll be right back. Good morning, EMIC. We want to invite you to our corporate prayer time every Sunday from 8 to 845. Glory to God. And we also have a new location the SLC Auditorium. We are beyond excited about this because of the word given through Brother Copeland that 2019 must be a year of more prayer coming forth out of the family. So we want to gather together as a church family and press into what the Lord wants to do in our church and our lives. So come bring your supply and join us right next door in the SLC Auditorium every Sunday morning. Hey everyone, I want to invite you to Kenneth Copeland and You, taking place Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, February 28th through March the 2nd. The night sessions with Brother Copeland will begin at 7 p.m., and you'll be a part of a live studio audience for the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. Join us Friday and Saturday morning at 9, 30, and 11 for workshops on healing, prosperity, and debt freedom by Pastors George and Terry Pearsons, Pastor Greg Stevens, and KCM board member Buddy Pilgrim. Children's services will be provided for birth through five years old in the mornings and from birth through fifth grade in the evenings. You do not want to miss this special faith building week. For more information and to register, visit emic.org slash events. We know you'll be glad you came. We're so excited to welcome Brother Jesse Duplantis as he ministers to us on Sunday, March 17th during our 10 a.m. service. Brother Jesse is a dynamic evangelist who has traveled throughout the world since 1978 preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He founded Jesse Duplantis Ministries with a desire to use every available voice to cover the earth with God's love. We're always uplifted when he speaks, so invite some family and friends and come ready to receive what God has to say to us. We'll see you there. For additional information about any of these events or to see what else is going on around the mountain, check out MyMIC. Follow any of our social media outlets or visit emic.org. I heard about Kenneth Copeland Bible College at the uh, 
convention in 2017. Then I think I was watching an EMIC church service and I heard them announce that they were going to release the Bible College. And as soon as I heard that, I felt something drop in my spirit. I was like, I, I know I'm supposed to go. I'm supposed to be there. I was actually at Southwest Believers Convention back in 2017. I found out about it and I just kind of felt God tell me that I was supposed to be here. When I heard about the college, I was like, this is the place I need to be. This is where God's calling me. God has been so good ever since I've been here. I've just had confirmation after confirmation that this is where I'm supposed to be. It was actually April or May, my senior year, I was getting ready to graduate. I felt uh, more leading to come here. I was just more at peace about coming here. And I'm so glad I did. I know that this is where God wanted me. I came here and it's just stretched me so much. So it's been a wonderful experience and I'm so glad that I'm here. Next Sunday, we want to bring people to the church that need healing. Next Sunday is Healing and Miracle Sunday here at Eagle Mountain. And we're going to hear from the Lord and we're going to see signs, wonders, and miracles in demonstration. Bring someone to church next week. You carry in here next Sunday that faith for miracle healing. A miracle healing service this weekend. Service starts at 10 a.m. Central. Come expecting God to change your life. Amen. So you can find out all of those right there on the website. Um, everywhere Brother Copeland is going to be at uh, kcm.org slash events or on the EMIC website. You can find out all about that. How many of you are students in the Bible College in the room? Ra ra raise your hand. Listen, I want to I want to touch on that again because what you have received, and I hope you're aware of what you received the last three days with Rick Renner. Put the address up again, guys, kcbiblecollege.org. Go ahead. You know you want to do it. You know God's calling you to do it. Order this uh, brochure because they just had three days of Rick Renner teaching New Testament doctrine. I mean, you don't get that. Jerry Savelle, Jesse Duplantis, Brother Copeland, you, you just don't get that anywhere. So go ahead, just take the step and order the brochure. Dr. Irby is waiting to talk to you and his staff. Do you have something you want to add to that? No? But you need to do it. You need to do it. You, you put it off last year, and, and now it's time uh, for you to take the step. Okay, it is offering time. You excited? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, you know this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7 says, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. I don't decide for you. Hello? You decide. The Holy Spirit resides where? And so he's going to tell you. So let each one give as he purposes his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. I'm going to read that uh, very quickly from the Passion. It says this, let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving. Have you ever experienced the joy of giving? Any of you guys like Christmas? Is Christmas anybody's favorite? Yes. Then you have experienced the joy of giving. Yes. All because God loves hilarious generosity. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you. Listen to this. More than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than enough of everything. Every moment and in every way, he will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do. Just as the scripture says about the one who trusts in him, because he has sown extravagantly and given to the poor, his kindness and generous deeds will never be forgotten. So we have a very special day tomorrow. Do you know what it is? In America, there's a, there's a little holiday that's, that's been declared by somebody, and it's a very special day. And what's it called? I didn't hear a single guy in this room know what day it was. You got it? You're the man, John. Let me talk to you real quickly about it. Claudius II was the emperor of Rome, and he decreed a decree. And the decree was that no young men of fighting age could be married because they needed to focus on being a soldier. So tradition teaches that a priest named Valentine would secretly marry young soldiers without the emperor knowing it. He was discovered. He was thrown into prison. 
and Claudius II outlawed Christianity because Christians would not worship Caesar. And so it was while in prison that the priest witnessed to other inmates, and one jailer um, had a daughter that was blind. And he asked Valentine to pray for her, and she was healed while he was in prison. All right? Word got back to the emperor, and emperor had Valentine executed for that. Before the execution, he wrote a note to the girl from your Valentine. He was killed on February the 14th in the year 269 A.D. And so that's where we get from your Valentine, is what he wrote to her. Scripture says in Proverbs 14 that a wise woman builds her house. If that's true, and it is, gentlemen, giving you clues, I'm throwing you little softballs. For you to say amen. Scripture says in Proverbs 14 that a wise woman builds her house, and it is true. Amen. All right, everybody stand up real quick. Stand up. Turn around. Wake up. No, I'm serious. I'm going to wake up before Pastor John gets up here. All right, be seated. Here we go. It says in Proverbs 14 that a wise woman builds her house, and it's true. Okay, there we go. Then a wise man will build his woman. The women all are amen in here. We gotta have some we need to have a men's ministry meeting or something here. That sums up, gentlemen, your Valentine motivation for you, right? Jesus often refers to husbands and wives as brides and bridegroom and marriage, and he linked himself to that church and to that relationship. Paul will double down on that in scripture. In Jesus' day, a marriage was a covenant arrangement. Once agreed upon, the parties would take a glass of wine and drink it as a remembrance of the covenant. And the groom would then give gifts to her and leave to prepare a place. Listen to this. When ready, the father would send for him and the wedding party to come get her. And they would call her out and she would go out to meet him. And at this time, is when she had been gathering gifts for him, and she would present those gifts to him at that time. Amen. Isn't that something? So let me read you that verse again, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one of us, as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is our giving in preparation of the day he'll say, come on home. And come get us. That's a quote from Psalm 112. Let me read Psalm 112 for you. It says, never stingy and always generous to those in need. Their lives of influence and honor will never be forgotten, for they are full of good deeds. That's who I want to be known as. How about you? So we want to give you the opportunity to sow tonight. Here's how you do it. If you're in the room and you want to give by check or a cash uh, there's an offering envelope right there in front of you. Those of you on the front row, the ushers will, will hand one um, to you as well. Or you can give online or on the computer, emic.org slash give, emic.org slash give. If you want to give by your cell phone or other mobile device, it's very easy. You can text to give. You text the number 36609. 36609, the keyword is EMIC plus the dollar amount. Example, EMIC 25,000. All right, EMIC 25,000. 25, whatever you, whatever you purpose in your heart to do, that's how you do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are who you said you are. We thank you are you are a rewarder. And Lord, I pray for your anointing on each and every person as they give joyfully from their heart. Father, that you will multiply this seed that's sown. You said you would. And Father, I pray that it explode on their behalf. And that even this week, turnaround comes. Seed comes back to them because you give seed to sowers that it comes. We sow this into the kingdom. Therefore, we, we are part of kingdom business. And I pray that the kingdom of heaven be expanded in their lives and in their workplace. And everything they put their hand to shall prosper and be blessed. I decree that. That just rose. Everything you put your hand to will prosper and be blessed. The kingdom of God is being expanded in your life, in your relationships, in your workplace, in your family. In Jesus' mighty name, because we're sowing today to the Master. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen.
Gentlemen, go ahead and serve the people. Are you ready for the word? Yes. Well, then do me a favor. Welcome with me, Pastor John Jester, to this platform. Hallelujah. Thank you. I better get up here. Pastor Greg got the preach on him. That was good, wasn't it? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I see baskets are still passing. And so we'll let that continue to pass. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, as we get ready to approach the word of God, we do so with awe and reverence. When we say, Father, whatever the word says, we believe it. We take it by faith. God, if the word says we can have it, then we can have it. If the word says we can do it, then we can do it. If the word says it's who we are, then it's who we are. And if the word tells us to do it, we will do it. We believe you, Father, and we take you at your word. Now, Lord, I'm asking that you think through my mind and speak through my lips, that this word would go forth unhindered and unchecked by any type of distraction or demonic force, that it would pierce the hearts of those who hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Before I get started, I want to go ahead and tell you that uh, your anticipation and expectancy level for Sunday needs to be on level 55,000. <laughs> Serious. It, this is, there are going to be signs, wonders, and miracles, and manifestations of the supernatural in this house on Sunday morning. If you believe it, shout amen. amen. But here's the thing. Um, that cannot be the responsibility of Pastor George. Now, I heard you shout amen a minute ago, and then everybody's like, Ugh. it's all right. I understand it's Wednesday. Shake off the cobwebs. It cannot be the responsibility of Pastor George and Pastor Terry or the pastoral staff here to believe that and to contend for that and to pull for that. When you place, when the people who are in the congregation, the people who are going to receive, those who are going to sit next to people who are going to receive, you you don't know that the chair that you're sitting in right now or the one next to you could be the very chair that someone has a divine appointment with on Sunday morning to receive the supernatural manifestation of their healing. And when you place a demand on the word and begin to pull on the word coming out of Pastor George, when you place a demand on the, how many of y'all were here Sunday morning, you heard Rick Renner talk about speaking to the atmosphere. When you place a demand on your faith and you begin to speak to the atmosphere so that the atmosphere gets right for the manifestation of miracles. When you stand on the word of God, when you begin right now, it's Wednesday, we still got time. When you begin right now to start to meditate on what God's will is, for Sunday morning and how he wants to transform people's lives. Listen, healing is the dinner bell, guys. Yes. Healing is healing is 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 that undeniable proof of the love of God. Amen. And it's a manifestation of the will of God for his people to be healthy and strong. Yes. And I believe that there's a healing move in the church that needs to manifest. Where the church becomes the place where people look to for help. When, when the doctors say that there's no hope, am I talking to the right people tonight? When the doctors say there's no hope, we need to be the people in the church that says, oh, that there's definitely hope. We don't, we don't have to send you out for 17 second opinions. We have the first opinion and that one opinion is the word of God and says by his stripes you were healed. And so that manifestation is coming to your body. We need to be contending for this on Sunday morning, pressing into it for Sunday morning. Amen? Amen. 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 So I'm excited about what's going to happen. And I want you to listen, put on your, be, be intentional about it. I'm, I'm looking at what healing outfit I'm going to wear on Sunday morning. I'm like, which one of these ties communicates healing the best? Like, what is the healing color? Like, what's the scheme that I need to be wearing? I'm looking at my shoes and making sure I got the right inserts so I don't have to sit down. Like, it's comfortable and I'm ready so I can run with the people who get up out of wheelchairs. I'm just saying that there's, and just get a vision for what Sunday morning is going to be like and press into that vision um, so that when you get here, your faith is red hot. My faith is red hot. And when we come together, one put a thousand to flight, but two, ten thousand of flight man there's gonna be some people flying in here on sunday morning amen 
Glory to God. I know our pastors are excited. I'm excited. Uh, I, my kids are excited. I'm getting my dog excited. We are all just excited. Speaking of excitement, we have an excited person on the front row uh, this evening. So, um, the, we, we, Miss Julie, isn't that right? Miss Julie is from California and flew here today tonight just to hear me preach. I'm kidding. Uh, but she flew here. She flew here on purpose on her birthday to be in the presence of the Lord. To be in the presence of the Lord. Now, I'm not going to tell anybody how old you are. That ain't, that's between you and Jesus and them if you want to tell them. But this was your first airplane flight. Is that right? Well, glory to God. Well, I want you to extend your hand toward her right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray over them. Lord, I thank you for them coming to this place, to the revival capital of the world. And Father, we declare that they're going to take this revival capital of the world anointing back with them. Father, I thank you that in the kingdom of God, with every passing year, there's an increase of anointing. And so, Father, I pray for increase of anointing right now on Miss Julie. Lord, I pray that you would give her dreams and revelations of what you've called her to be and what you've called her to do. And God, that you would grant unto her a spirit of wisdom and understanding and operation. Lord, I pray that there would be an increase in the unction of the Holy Ghost on her, that she would sense your presence in a tangible way. And Lord, I thank you for blessing their family. I thank you for blessing their family. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Happy birthday to you. Glory to God. All right, let's get into the word of God. I want you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. It is my goal to one day have the book of Hebrews memorized. I got to hang out a lot with Rick Renner uh, this past week, um, and I'm believing that that hanging out with Rick Renner is going to show tonight. Uh, I'm not going to try to speak any Greek to you. However, I'm going to tell you the meanings of some words, but I'm, it's my desire that that uh, that Rick Rennerness just kind of splashed over on to me. And, um, and I noticed something about Rick Renner. He has memorized scripture, memorized scripture, made me want to get my game up. I was like, gee whiz, I need to come on, John, what are you doing? I mean, you make he, that man, that man has forgotten more scripture than I know. I'm like, come on, I need to, I need to get in on it. I need to get in on it. So, uh, I'm one, one day I endeavor to have memorized that much scripture. But I'm not going to pull that on you tonight. I was going to Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to look at verse six. Uh, last week we talked about vision and we'll do a little bit of review here, but let me, let me read the scripture first. Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him being God for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Last week, we talked about vision, ingredients for vision and functions for vision. And so just as a quick review, I'm not going to go into depth here. We talked about five and key ingredients for vision. One is vision uh, for the believer has to start and be carried out in faith. It cannot, you cannot have God given vision without activating your faith for that vision. Number two, vision must be written and spoken. Number three, action is a must when we're talking about vision. We talked about how people say talk is cheap. Well, that's only true. It, that's only true if there's no corresponding action with your talking. Talk is never cheap in the kingdom of God. Talk, talk carries or words carry the power of almighty God. But when your words are not accompanied by corresponding action, then you are not demonstrating that you believe what it is that you say you believe. Amen. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Number four, vision necessitates revelation. You have to have revelation knowledge in order to have a God-given vision. Number five, it also necessitates cooperation. You helped me with this up on the stage, up on the stage and how he cooperated with me pulling him up off of the floor. Y'all remember that? I see some of you shaking your heads. Functions of vision. Vision causes momentum. Number one. Vi number two, vision will provoke honor. Number three, vision will restrain you. That's Proverbs 29. 
And we'll talk about that in a moment. Number four, vision begets vision. And number five, spoken word based vision carries God's power and will put that power to work for you. So we talked about all of those places of vision. I want to kind of go back, though, and I want to start with answering a question. I would like for this to be a time of application for you. And so I want to start with answering a question. It's my unction in the Holy Ghost that there were some visions that were woken up last week that you begin. I think Pastor Greg even prayed it, that there are people whose vision, who had a vision for what it is that they were supposed to do, or God has given them a vision, or maybe there's a vision in your life that has grown dormant and now it's reactivated, re-energized, or maybe God has begun to download some things to you that are, that are a part of God's will for your life. And it's provoking vision in you and it's making you hungry for the things of God. It's stirring the things of God inside of you. And the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when the word of God is imparted into you, then faith builds and faith is hungry. Faith is constantly reaching out for the things of God. But what happens when God says something to you that seems way too big? What happens when God says something to you that seems way too big? I had a very candid conversation once with a person who is a financial uh, expert. At least I consider him to be a financial expert. And I told him this. I said, I believe that God has called me to be wealthy. Amen. Now, everybody in here be like, hey, amen. So, amen. hey, glory to God. Me too. Hallelujah. I got an unction on that. Somebody was just stood up, and danced a little bit. And <laughs> hallelujah. Glory to God. You felt a move of the Holy Ghost on that. Um, but I, but I really I really do. And it's different. But it, it's different. Uh, then God has just called me to be, you know, to, to be well off or to not want or to be able to. But I truly believe that there's a calling on my life to help finance things in the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, if you knew where I came from, you would understand how big that is in reference to where I came from. Amen. There ain't nothing in my genealogy that would point to that statement. Not nothing, <laughs> nothing. There's all, there's, there, there is one part that I'm very proud of. My, uh, my grandparents were sharecroppers in North Georgia. They uh, were descendants of slaves in, in North Georgia and they became sharecroppers after the Emancipation Proclamation. I was privileged to know my great grandparents. Uh, my mom had me very young, so I was privileged to know my great grandparents. And I could I remember hearing oral stories about um, about my grandparents and my great grandparents and my ancestors and their tenacity and their uh, vigor and their commitment and their uh, some of it was their their faith, not really knowing how to identify that. But some of it was an oper uh, an operation of faith. Um, and um, so whenever they whenever they, they own land. And they farmed their land. And that's how they took care of themselves. They were very self-sufficient. They depended pretty much on themselves. Was a, a, his, a series of circumstances happened in my family that ended that and brought about some pretty extreme poverty and dependence on the state and on welfare and things like that. And it wasn't until I started to dig back into some of those things that uh, my great grandparents had imparted to me and uh, looking through my great grandfather's Bible and some of those other things and finding some things that just indicated, man, I'm not supposed to be poor. And the Lord began to really uncover some things. And he spoke something to me that said, you're called to wealth. And I went, yes. it was a gut shot because it's really cool to wag your head at that. But when you hear that from the Holy Ghost, and you understand the gravity of that statement. And I look back over this and I go, say what? I don't see not one piece of wealth in any of my bloodline. And it reminds me of when God called me to preach. I also don't have any <laughs> preachers in my bloodline. And the night God called me to preach, it was shortly after I was saved and I stayed up all night long and I felt something in my gut telling me that I was supposed to do something for God. 
And it wasn't until the wee hours of the morning that I said, okay, Lord, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'll do. And that thing that was in my gut subsided, but I knew that, that it was big. And as that thing started to unravel, you got to understand, I hated preachers. I'm this, this is kind of confessional just a little bit, but I want you to, I want you to understand what I'm talking about tonight. I hated preachers. Like I didn't just dislike them. I hated them. And I didn't want anything to do with the church when I was a teenager. And I didn't want anything to do with anyone who would had any semblance of religion on them or out of the church. I, I was so angry with the church and I was angry with pastors and I was angry at myself. And I was just good old fashioned angry. And a friend of mine led me to the Lord. Um, that's a different story. But after uh, being saved was one thing. Okay. I, my, my grandparents again had taught me about Jesus, right? And I could get with having a relationship with Jesus and loving Jesus and, you know, maybe church ain't so bad and I'll go back. At least they feed you for free. That kind of thing. Um, no, I'm serious. Like I was in college. I wanted every piece of free food I could get. Um, and, um, when the Lord called me to preach, there was nothing in anything to indicate that I should be able to do that. Nothing. I went to my pastor and said, I believe I'm called to pastor. And he said, all right, that's awesome. And that was pretty much the end of that conversation. <laughs> and, I, and there was nothing to indicate that I ought to be able to do that. How do you respond when God tells you something about yourself or gives you a vision for your life that seems so large that it's almost outlandish and physically, naturally impossible. What do you do? It's not enough to just say, okay, God, okay, okay, and just wag your head at it. And it's also not okay to walk away from it and pretend like it never happened. And a lot of times visions grow dormant because we pretend like God never said anything when God actually did say something. And we don't want to talk about what God really said. And we don't want to explore the vastness of what God really said because we're too busy looking at us as opposed to looking at him. What do you do when the vision seems way bigger than anything that you can comprehend with your physical mind? Well, the first point of last week was vision for the believer requires faith. Here's why. Faith is the only thing that pleases God. Amen. If you read this scripture in Greek or in the, in the Greek, it says... Outside of or abstaining from faith, it's impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God without faith. And just a hint, you know, if God gave you a vision, then that vision is pleasing to him. And it's impossible for you to operate in something pleasing to God without using your, your faith. It's important that you understand the vastness of of that statement. He, and it says that those who come to him must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But the second thing is it says he rewards people who seek him. He rewards those who use their faith to seek him. That word reward literally means he pays wages. Amen. He pays wages. When you employ your faith to seek God, to seek him out, when you, you, when you engage your passion and your vigor to seek out God, God is a rewarder of those who see. God is not playing hide and seek with you. He is not trying to hide from you and see how, how long you'll just kind of press in there and he's dodging you. And like my kids play hide and seek. They hide under everything, laundry. Like they hide in some of the most obscure places. I was like, I would have never looked there. God is never, God is not trying to run from you. God says that if you will just press in and seek him, he will reward your seeking of him, which means that he will pay wages for your seeking. Now, don't think wages as in your clock in paycheck. Think there is an end to seeking God that is good for you. 
But there's another word. It says you have to believe that he is and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This word he is, is the word you have to actually go back to the Hebrew to get the full meaning of this word. You must believe that he is this. He is statement is connected to the I am statement. This you must believe that he is, is all the places in the Bible where Jesus says, I am. And when God says, I am. You got to understand that when the I am is in who you are, that everything that he is, is also involved in everything that you are. The full weight of his is, is involved. So I want us to look at this. Go to the book of Exodus. We're going to look at Exodus chapter three. Exodus chapter three. I want to start at verse seven. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them and to bring them from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Somebody say amen Amen. to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and everybody else's whose name ends in it. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. For a barefooted dude on the side of a mountain, this is a big download. Coming out of a bush that is not being burned away, but is definitely on fire. What do you do when God says something really big? And you're, well, listen, whatever you do, you, you didn't get it from a burning bush with no sandals on your feet. This was a huge download because the children of Israel had been in slavery for a very, very long time. And this was one man being told, you are going to bring my people out of captivity, a captivity that was so ingrained and entrenched in Israel that all Israel knew how to do was be slaves. What happens when God tells you you're going to be bigger than what you came from? What happens when God tells you you're going to be bigger than what you've learned how to be? What happens when God says, I'm going to have to teach you a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of talking, a whole new way of being, a whole new way of understanding, because what you used to do will not work in what you're called to do. Moses is on the side of a mountain and he sees this burning bush and God begins to download to him that he is going to break captivity that is so ingrained and entrenched in Israel that that's all they know. And so Moses has the response that most of us would have. Should look at verse 16. He says, well, actually, let's go back. Let's go back. Verse 13. Well, actually, no. Verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I am come, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? This tells you how ingrained the captivity was. Moses says, when I get over there and tell them that the God of their father sent me, they're going to ask me, what's his name? Who is this God that you speak of? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am 
who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Those words, I am, encapsulate all of the personality of Almighty God. I am. I am. I am. I'm the answer. I'm the beginning. I'm the end. And there's nothing about it that I don't know already. See, what you got to understand is when God calls you to something bigger than you, he didn't call you to that thing on your own. The I am is with you in it. Moses had this understanding that when I get over there, I'm just going to be by myself. And God said, no, I'm going to go with you. And when they ask you who's with you, just tell them I am is with you. So in Hebrews, when it says without faith, it is impossible to please God because those who come to him must believe that he is the I am. And that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You have to believe that God is who he says he is. You cannot do what God has called you to do without believing that God is who he says he is. But watch what happens. Verse 16, God says, go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob appeared to me saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt with to a to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. So he sends them to the elders to tell him and to tell them that the I am that the God of your fathers remind them of who God is. You've heard of Abraham, right? Oh, yeah. They talk about Abraham. You've heard of Isaac, right? Yeah. They talk, they talk about Isaac. You've heard of Jacob, right? Yeah. Yeah. They talk. About, I am the God of those men. And maybe you've been in captivity so long that you don't know who I am, but let me reveal to you who I am. Now watch this. Chapter four. It's okay if we do a little Bible study tonight. Chapter four, verse 29. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke to all Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed. Now, who is he talking to? He's talking to the elders. He's talking to the people. When I studied this scripture, y'all, the first time I ever read it, I got the impression that Moses had gathered together the entire nation of Israel. I guess I missed the part where it says he went to the elders. So he got a small group of elders, maybe small, I say small, relatively, group of elders, and he's telling them who sent him and showing them the signs. And watch what it says. So the people, the elders, when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction and then they bowed their head and worshiped, they believed. It says the people believed. The people believed. This word believe is a Hebrew word that can mean they trusted, but it can also mean they supported. There's a difference between trusting God and just supporting what God says. Sometimes whenever we hear something good from the word of God, we kind of support it. Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. I can just see the the elders doing that to Moses. What Moses, you gonna get us out of captivity? Oh, that's awesome. They had no idea what freedom even was. They just knew it sounded cool. I'll prove that to you in just a few minutes. They had no idea what freedom was. They just knew that freedom sounded like a cool thing. So when Moses comes along and says, we are going to, God has spoken and he is delivering you out of the hand of the Egyptians. I can just see the elders now going, Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. Moses, Moses, Moses. 
We support you, Moses. It's different than engaging your faith. It's different than engaging your faith. That's some of y'all look at me like I got three heads. Let me go ahead and prove it to you, okay? All right, go to Exodus chapter, uh, let's see, 14. Exodus chapter 14. So you guys know kind of the rest of the story, right? He goes and there are the plagues and he goes to Pharaoh and he talks to Pharaoh about bringing them out or letting his people go. Y'all have seen the movie, that kind of thing, right? Let my people go. Don't let the movie substitute reading your Bible. Go read your Bible. All right. But um, after all of the plagues, last one being death of the firstborn, the children of Israel are released they go, they are, they're walking, they're traveling cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. In other words, these are hints and a half that God is with them. All right. How would you like to go to your workplace every day with a cloud that just surrounds you? Your boss ain't going to say not one word to me today. I'm telling you, I got a cloud, got a cloud and a pillar of fire. You say you want me to do what? Pillar of fire. Pillar of fire. Knowing that God is with me. Right? These are, these are, extra, but you got to understand that even though there are extraordinary signals to provoke their faith, they don't have any clue what all this means because they've spent so long in captivity. What happens when God comes to you and says, I'm bringing you out of captivity and all you've ever known is captivity. You got to stretch in larger capacity to believe because the knee jerk reaction is just like Moses, not me, God. Who am I? I'm not supposed to be able to do that. I, I shouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, I can believe you to pay my bills. I can believe you to have a little extra, but I'm supposed to believe you for abundant harvest. You mean to tell me it's on my faith to believe you for my healing? I just want somebody to lay hands on me. Somebody who's got great faith, somebody who's got big faith, somebody who's bigger than me. I'm not coming against the laying on of hands. I'm just saying somebody who's who's better in a better situation or in a better pre predicament or a better position to be able to impart these things. But you're supposed to be the one Amen. to be able to impart these things. Amen. Listen, you are the ones to get people saved. The fivefold ministry is given for the equipping of the saints. How y'all doing, saints? All the saints wave at me. You're the one. You're the one. You're the one that has to take what you hear in here and take it out to the masses, out to the people in your sphere of influence. And when you're looking at God going, uh-uh, not me. That's not, that's not for me. That's for the dude with the microphone. And that's for the guys that do the, do the heavy lifting. And I'm just the, the little no, no, God has not called you to be a little nobody. God has called you to shake loose of what's been holding you back. And engage your faith in the vastness of what he's called you to. And so you see these people walking in the wilderness, the, the Israelites walking in the wilderness, cloud of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. God is with them. There's all kinds of confirmation that God is with them. <coughs> Pharaoh, excuse me for a second. I got so excited that my throat got excited. Pharaoh says, wait a minute, what do we do? We just let the Egyptians go. Who's going to work for us? <laughs> and so he begins to pursue them. I think this is a picture of what happens when you get a little bit of breakthrough. And then all of a sudden, the enemy tries to remind you of who you're really supposed to be. Can I just be real with you for a second? I had one of those moments today. It's meditating on this word. It's meditating on this word. Preaching this word. And I heard the Lord say, there's nobody in your family that does this. 
you're not qualified. Now, listen, I'm not telling you that so you feel sorry for me. Don't, because I told the devil what he could do and where he could go immediately after that. I recognize that. So, but what I'm telling you is, is the reason I started this off by telling you about my family is I want you to understand that regardless of where you came from and regardless of what you see right now, the word of God is still true concerning your life. What God's called you to is still true. I don't care if God called you to do it and you messed it up 15 bazillion times and you can't even count the amount of times that you've fallen back into your old way of being. Listen, if God spoke it, he is still true to his word and he's just waiting on you to believe him and to take him at what he has said concerning you. Children of Israel are out in the desert, cloud by day, fire by night, all these confirmations. Pharaoh begins to pursue them and they look back and they see the army of Pharaoh coming at them. They see their past coming at them. They see their past coming at them. What happens when you get a financial breakthrough and then three weeks later you see your past coming back at you? What happens when there's a manifestation of your healing? But then shortly after that pain tries to come back. Well, listen to what the children of Israel said. Verse 11, chapter 14. Then they said, they said to Moses, were there not enough graves in Egypt? Have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Are you serious? These were the people that were beating you, whooping you, subjugating you, taking your children. And you're mad at the guy who brought you out of that because you would have rather died in a grave for something that you understand than to go after something that you don't understand, even if it means your freedom. I'm asking you. Over and over and over again, what happens when your past is breathing down your neck? Their statement to Moses was a very logical statement. It'd be easier for us to just go back to Egypt and die than to be out here with you. You've brought us out here to die. Verse 12. Is this not the word of the Lord we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. This does not sound like they believed back when Moses was talking to the elders. The Bible says the elders believed. This is not they believed. This was, we told you to leave us alone. We were just fine. <laughs> then Moses talks to God. God says, why are you talking to me? You have everything you need to solve the problem. Verse 13. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he has accomplished for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall know, you, you shall see, uh, well, for the Egyptians you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Now that's talking to vision. The Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Now let's stop right there. There's this big body of water right in front of them. An obvious barrier to where it is they're going. And God doesn't even address the water in his first statement. He just says, all I told you to do is move forward. See, here's the thing. When God tells us something big, we think that the bigness that God has told us is supposed to come to pass right then. If God brought us up out of Egypt, then he should have just burned the Egyptians up in Egypt, hooked us up with all their stuff 
And we should have been able to just leave and be free. Matter of fact, why are we in the wilderness anyway? Why don't we just take over Egypt? Let God come down, zap all the Egyptians. We'll just take over Egypt and it'll be all good, right? God said, go forward. He didn't tell them to take the whole enchilada in one bite. Sometimes we walk away from our vision because we think we got to swallow the whole thing in one bite. When God called me to pastor, I just told him, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'll do. And he left me alone until my conversation with my pastor. And that left me alone until another conversation with another deacon. And then he left me alone until another time, until someone asked me to be a youth pastor. I was like, be a what? I don't even like teenagers. <laughs> The youth pastor at our, at our, the guy who was the youth pastor had resigned. And, and I was like, look, I, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Just trying to be obedient. I didn't like teenagers. They smelled funny. They act weird. I just got finished being one. So, you know, I didn't like them, right? I definitely didn't like teenagers. If I had thought that I had to take the whole thing on in that moment, I'd have walked away. And sometimes people get upset because God's not showing them the whole part or the whole picture of what it is that he's called them to do. Maybe he's not showing you the whole pictures because your faith isn't ready to take the whole picture. And maybe just maybe you can't take the whole picture, but you can take the first step. He told the children of Israel, listen, just move forward. Why? Well, because they're grumbling because their past is breathing down their neck. I can't just give them everything. I just need them to take me at my word for the next step. That's a word for somebody. Somebody in here, you need to just take God at his word for the next step. Stop looking too far ahead. Know that what's ahead is coming. The vision is for an appointed time and it will not delay. It won't tarry. Just wait for it and it'll come. But believe God for the next step. Just believe God for the next step. We're getting somewhere. So we know the story, right? The pillar of fire moves from the front of the Egyptians or from the front of the children of Israel behind them, creates a blockade. Moses stretches out his hands. They parts the Red Sea. They go over on dry ground. I find it interesting that there was not even mud when they crossed over. All right. So some of y'all believe in God for the next step. Just believe God for the next step. And not only the next step, but the next step is going to be better than the last step. Yes. It's going to call you to a higher place. But God himself is going to ordain those steps. The steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. If God ordered the step, then there's nothing that you have to fear about taking the step. And I'm talking about this is a scary walk. You know what I'm saying? Like they're, they're walking through the Red Sea. With two walls of water on their right and on their left. You don't believe me? Look at what the Bible says. It says the walls of water were on their right and on their left. They were literally waving at fish. Hey. <laughs> Walking through the Red Sea. Believe God for your next step. God tells Moses to stretch out his hands, covers up the Egyptian. They get to the other side, they singing and dancing and Miriam comes out there with her tambourine and there's this big praise service and glory to God. Hallelujah. Won't he do it? <laughs> and we're all excited about what God is doing until chapter 6, 15, verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Now, when they had come to Mara, they could not drink the waters for, Mar for of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people complained against Moses. Wait a minute. Are these the same people who were in the worship service last Sunday? I mean... <laughs> Sorry, this is a little bit of a slip. Aren't these the same people who were just at the worship service on the banks of the Red Sea? Right, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about them anyway. I'm just saying, aren't these the same people who saw a move of God and now need a move of God 
but are complaining to God because they're not seeing the move of God that they want to see, even though they've seen a move of God. Come on, church. We got to get this right. We got to get this right. This is one of those areas that we've got to get right. Because if God did it before, he's the same God today and he'll do it again. If he's ever paid your bill, he'll pay the bill again. If he's ever brought you away from foreclosure, he'll bring you away from foreclosure again. If he's ever provided a car, he'll provide it again. If he's ever healed your body, then he'll heal it again. He's not going to stop. You just got to take him at his word. Now watch what they say. They start complaining against Moses. Now I want to want to show you something that's interesting here. This word complained literally means grumbled, complain. It also has another meaning. It means to stop over and abide. I thought that was interesting. I looked at it and went, huh? Stop over and abide. Like you would stop at a rest stop and stay there overnight. And I, so I began to wonder, I was like, God, why did you use that word to describe what they were doing? And the Lord began to speak to me and he said this, those same people were just rejoicing for what I did at the Red Sea. But when the next challenge came, their faith stopped. And they begin to grumble and complain. There was a stopping point to their faith. You've heard Pastor George say, faith begins where the will of God is known. But he also says this, faith stops where? At the question mark. When you begin to question what God is doing. When you begin to, to, to doubt that God is actually going to do what he said he's going to do. It says that they got to a place where there was no water and the only water there was bitter. And they couldn't drink it. They complained and they stopped believing. They grumbled and complained. So he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast, when, uh, when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statue and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them and he said, and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, listen, to take him at his word. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight. How do you please God? Faith. Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. That's where we get Jehovah Rapha. I am the God that healeth thee. He healed the waters. There was healing taking place. We got deliverance. We got healing happening. And you would think that after this, they were good. God, that's, a, that's an awesome demonstration. I got delivered. I got healed. I got set free. Glory to God. I'm good. Nope. Let's look at uh, chapter 15. Uh, no, chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Literally just a few scriptures later. And they journeyed to Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, and between Elam and Sinai, the, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. So this is very soon after Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained again. Look at this. They're complaining again. Complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had... ...is to kill this whole assembly with hunger. We're scared, he delivers them. We're thirsty, gives them something to drink. And now you would think that the natural progression is we're hungry, he's going to feed them. Nope. 
What do you do when God calls you to step into something that's so big that you can't see where the next provision is coming from? Now, understand, I'm not telling you to cast wisdom away and just start doing things that are unwise. God will prepare you. But sometimes we get into a place where we have to relearn how to estimate who we are in him. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. And your life doesn't belong to you anymore. Your life belongs to him. So when he asks you to do something that you don't understand, when he asks you to do something that you may not have all of the direction for, it necessitates that you step into a place of just trusting him and believing he is who he says he is. Amen. They grumble, complain. Moses answers them. They get manna. They get quail. God provides for them. Now, for sake of time, I want to take you to the book of Hebrews and show you what the writer of the book of Hebrews says about this whole entire debacle. Hebrews chapter four. We've kind of come the long way around to prove a point. Hebrews chapter four. Starting at verse one. I'm in the Amplified Bible. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still holds and is offered today, let us be afraid that be afraid doesn't mean fear. It means let's reverence, let us reverence God to, to distrust it. Lest any of you should think he has come too late and has come short of reaching it. For indeed, we have the glad tidings, the gospel preached to us. As truly as they, the Israelites of old, had the good news of deliverance from bondage preached to them. So the gospel today of deliverance for you is the exact same gospel of deliverance that was delivered to them concerning freedom from bondage and stepping into the vastness of the calling of God. Watch what he says about it. But the message they heard did not benefit them because it was not mixed with. It wasn't mixed with what? Huh. They heard the voice of Aaron and Moses concerning God's will to deliver them. The elders believed the congregation did not. And that same deliverance message that was preached then is true through Jesus Christ. But it will not benefit you unless it's mixed with your faith. Look at what it says. With the learning, with the leaning in the Amplified, with the leaning of the entire personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness. By those who heard it, neither were they united in faith with the ones Joshua and Caleb who heard it and did believe. So what does he say? The leaning of your entire personality, your entire thought process, every part of you on the power of God. What do you do when God downloads something to you that's so big that you can't fathom how it's going to happen? You have to get out of your own personality and your own thought process and lean everything that you have on the person and the power of Almighty God. You got to believe that he is. He is the great I am. He's all that he says he is, and he'll do what he said he's going to do. It says that the same message was preached to them as it's preached to us, and it didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with their faith. 
That's why faith is the primary ingredient in your vision. Because you can hear what God said, but if you don't believe what he said, then you're never going to receive what he said. Amen. You've got to believe it. You can hear what he said, but if you don't believe what he said, you'll never receive what he said. It has to be mixed with your faith. I want you to look at what else it said. It said that they were to enter into the rest. I heard this preach before and I, and I don't remember exactly who said it, but um, I trust it. And it was this. The greatest expression of faith is rest. I believe that's Creflo Dollar that might have said that. The greatest expression of faith is rest. The greatest expression of faith is rest. And I was looking back through my Bible when I've taught this before. And actually the definition that I have in here for rest is this. To make quiet. To cause to be at rest. To lead to a quiet abode. To still. To cause striving. To do. To, uh, to cause striving to do something. To cease and desist. To take a rest. But it's interesting that one of the definitions for this word rest is restrain. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says, where there is no revelation, no vision, the people cast off restraint. How is rest restraint? Well, here's the thing. If you are resting in, it, in his promise, it restrains you from doing anything except staying in a position of resting in his promise. Amen. It stops you from toiling. When you make the decision, I'm going to believe what God said concerning me and I'm going to rest in that. I'm not going to be worried about all this other stuff. I'm just going to stop and take God at his word. Amen. It restrains you from doing anything else except believing God. Amen. It stops you from trying to figure out how to fix it on your own. It stops you from trying to figure out how to be what God's called you to be all by yourself. Listen, I knew nothing about pastoring. I mean nothing. Nothing. Praise God for godly men and women who are examples that you can look to. And a great man raised me in ministry. And I have great mentors today. I know a whole lot more 18 years later than I knew 18 years before. And there was some formal training in that. There was some stuff that happened, but I, there was nothing that would have indicated that I should be standing here in front of you today. I didn't even want to do it. Where are you at in your vision? Where are you at in what God's called you to do? And, and if you heard that and you went, oh, he's being too personal. Don't take it that way. Don't take it that way. The truth of the matter is, is I need you to start activating faith for what God's called you to be. The body of Christ needs you Amen. to start activating your faith for what God has called you to be. Because I can't be what God's called you to be. But here's the thing. I need what God's called you to be. We need your gifts. We need your callings. If, listen, revival capital of the world means people descend upon this place to look for the truth being preached Amen. and ministered to. Amen. They, they're looking for the authentic. Me, Pastor Greg, the staff pastors here, the people who work for the church, we cannot carry that load. We need whatever God's downloaded to you in your vision because he put you here and connected you here. He, you're a partner here. You're a member of this church. Or you're a part of what we're doing. We need what's in you to make what we see come to pass. That's it. Amen. That's it's it. got to happen. That's it. It's got to happen. But you've got to rest. Yes. You've got to put, let me put it this way. You've got to put doubt to rest. 
and decide, I'm just going to sit where God told me to sit and I'm going to be who God's called me to be and I'm going to do what God's called me to do and I'm good with that. I'm not constantly looking for the next best thing. I'm good with just believing God for the next step. What else do you do? Well, you focus on expanding your faith. I don't have a whole lot of time to do this, but go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. You focus on expanding your faith. How many of times, how many times have you heard Pastor George say, we've got to increase our capacity to believe? I've said that almost to, to almost so much that I don't want to hear myself say it anymore. However, I need to hear myself say it. Because just when I thought that I had a great capacity to believe God, God shows me something that's bigger than my capacity to believe God. So I got to go back and expand my capacity to be able to receive what God has said concerning me and concerning this place, concerning my assignment. Look at Romans chapter 12. Start at verse 1. I thought I'd turn there, but I decided to come over there and talk to you. Romans chapter 12, starting verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If this doesn't sound like you working on your vision, then I don't know what else to tell you. This word that you may prove literally means this, that you may recognize as genuine after examination and approve and deem worthy what is the will of God. You do that. How do you do that? Watch this. Verse three. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. To think soberly. Uh, Pastor Rick Renner taught on this word today. To think soberly literally means to be level headed in your thought process. To have your mind renewed to the things of God and to think soberly. But I want you to understand something about this scripture. This scripture did not say, don't think highly of yourself. That's not what the scripture said. It said, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Well, how ought I think? How he thinks. I ought to be thinking of myself in light of what God is doing in me with the measure of faith that has been dealt to me and according to the development of that measure of faith. So the more I expand my capacity to believe God, the more I see myself the way God sees me. And the more I see myself the way God sees me, the more I estimate not my own power, but the power of Christ that lives in me. Greater is he that lives in me than he that is in the world. And the more I get a picture that it's not about my limitations, but it's about what God is doing in me and I'm able to receive that, then I'm able to then prove for myself what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's kind of like I I told somebody else, it was kind of like if you would imagine my hand and a bowling ball sitting on top of my hand and that bowling ball is your vision it's your calling right if my hand is kind of shaped like a cone right and that bowling ball is sitting on top of it. i went bowling not too long ago and i realized that i'm not as good a bowler as i had envisioned in my mind i thought i had skills and i tried to do the spinny thing down the aisle so i looked like the people on pbr it didn't work Anyway, 
if the bowling ball is sitting on top of my hand and my hand is kind of shaped like that and that bowling ball sitting in that bowling ball is my calling, some of that bowling ball may get down into that space, but that bowling ball is not going to seat itself until I start to expand the capacity of my hand to receive the fullness of that bowling ball. And it's not until that bowling ball seats itself in my hand that I'm actually carrying and able to bear the full capacity, the full size of that bowling ball. What if I told you that your calling operates that way? Your vision operates that way. That just when you thought you couldn't do what it is that God has called you to do, it's not dependent on your ability to do it. It's dependent on your ability to exercise and expand your faith. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Your capacity to receive all that God's called you to be. So here's a nugget. If you're having trouble believing God for what it is he's promised you, stop focusing on you and start focusing on expanding your faith. That's not the time to stop listening to teachings. That's the time to press into them. That's not the time to stop reading your Bible. That's the time to press into it because he will use the word of God to enlarge your capacity to receive. You got to see yourself the way God sees you. God sees you healed regardless of what your doctor's report says. God sees you saved and, and that word saved literally encompasses your healing and your wholeness. He said that he would that you prosper above all things that he would that you prosper and be in health, be strong physically. We got to get a vision for our physical healing. What does it look like to be renewed in your body? What does it look like to run and not grow weary and to walk and not faint? What does it look like to, 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 to be able to cast the limits off? You can't forget that he'll do what he said he'll do. Got to get a vision for what that looks like. And as you can expand your capacity to believe God for what he said he's going to do, you'll find that that thing just drops right into place. And it's not you just stumbling upon your healing. No, you're working on your healing because you're expanding your capacity to believe. You're working on the vision because you're expanding your capacity to believe. You're working on your finances because you're expanding your capacity to believe God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you for this one person saying, Amen. thank you, Lord. And everybody else is kind of like, is he done yet? Glory to God. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. One more scripture. One more, one more scripture. Ephesians chapter three. Go to Ephesians chapter three. We're almost done. I had way more scriptures in here. I thought we'd get done. I just like talking to y'all. Y'all are like easy to preach to. Ephesians chapter three, starting at verse 14. For this reason, seeing the greatness, I'm in the Amplified Bible, for this reason, seeing the greatness of this plan by which you are built together in Christ, I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom every family in earth, in heaven and on earth is named, that Father from which all fatherhood takes his name and derives its title, may he grant you out of the rich treasury of his glory to be strengthened and reinforced with mighty power in your inner man by the Holy Spirit himself and dwelling in your innermost being and personality. There's your personality again. May Christ through your, say it loud, Amen. say it like you ain't scared of it. Amen. May Christ through your faith actually dwell, settle down, abide, make his permanent home in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love. Watch this, that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints. What is the breadth and length and height and depth That you may really come, that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourself, the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge. 
without experience. The vastness, greatness of the calling that he's called you to. I'm going to tell you something about God vision. If you thought it's big now, it only gets bigger. But as the vision gets bigger, your faith is supposed to be, get bigger. I believe there's going to come a day. This is my vision. I believe there's going to come a day when people come in here in their conditions and they leave in his condition. I believe there's coming a day when people come in here in their finances and they leave with his finances. I believe that there's coming a day when people drive onto this property and they sense the presence of God so heavy that it transforms their marriage while they're sitting in their car. If I believe that and you're amening me, then my inclination is that you believe that. So my question is, what are you doing about it? Because you're a part of it. Are you expanding your capacity to believe it? Amen. Glory to God. That's all I got. Hello, Faith Family. Michelle Stevens here. Just wanted to greet you. We have a lot of upcoming events coming up, and, and we wanted to just take a minute here and, and talk to you about each of those events um, that are coming to you and to us here on the mountain. If you'll just take a look at this, we'll come right back. Come to a Kenneth Copeland Ministries event, February 28th through March 2nd. This winter, come to Kenneth Copeland and you at Eagle Mountain International Church in Newark, Texas, USA. March 29th through 30th, join us for Miracles on the Mountain at Eagle Mountain International Church in Newark, Texas, USA. April 4th through 6th, Kenneth Copeland and Jerry Savelle welcome you to the 2019 Branson Victory Campaign in Branson, Missouri, USA. For more information, go to kcm.org slash events. You have to be here. You just have to be here and experience it for yourself firsthand. If you want to be part of something bigger than yourself, you've got to be in the room. It's not just the word that blesses you, but it's the glory that falls after the messages. When you get in a meeting like this, the plan of God for your life becomes clear and your life will never be the same. Where I come from, you don't get this anywhere for free. The presence of God is here and you need to be here too. Don't forget, you can go to kcm.org slash events to catch up on all the things that are upcoming, but especially coming. You're live in the service. It's important for us to put faith to action or action to our faith and then and be here in the services. So we want to encourage you to be here. You can register online for any of our events as well. Registration is free, but again, we just want to know you're going to be here. If you can't be here in person, we know you can be there by faith in the spirit with us where you're at. It's going to be a really special event, and I'm not going to say why, other than I'll be hosting for you tomorrow. A uh, little little tidbit there. We've got a really exciting uh, time there that we're going to have with your home group. It's at 4.30 Eastern Time, 3.30 here in Texas. So we want you to join us on that as well. It, we also have a five minutes before we go live. You can watch us uh, on Facebook Live, which is really a fun fun thing to do as well. Um, but want to top it off here with our very special service that's coming up this Sunday with Pastor George. We're going to watch this real quick. Next Sunday, we want to bring people to the church that need healing. Next Sunday is Healing and Miracle Sunday here at Eagle Mountain. And we're going to hear from the Lord and we're going to see signs, wonders, and miracles in demonstration. Bring someone to church next week. You carry in here next Sunday that faith for miracle healing. A miracle healing service this weekend. Service starts at 10 a.m. Central. Come expecting God to change your life. You do not want to miss that miracle healing service here at our 10 a.m. 
service. It will be 11 uh, Eastern time to join us if you're watching us on BVOVN. Of course, any of our other available voices that you you watch us with. We just want to encourage you in your faith. Be ready for that that healing. We know that is coming to you. We just want to pray for you. Don't forget that we love you here. God loves you. And Jesus is Lord.